In this session, I'll be sharing the stage with my colleague, Dr. Issa. And uh, what we plan is that um, there will be two um, uh, presentations. First, we will start with Dr. Issa, and he will speak around 15, 20 minutes, and there will be a um, Q&A session to follow. And after that, I'll take over, and, and I will give my talk, and which will follow another Q&A. And in this session of power, the first will be focusing on the power of moderation. And after that, I'll be talking about the moderation of power. So we will have some sort of juxtaposition um, in terms of dealing with the issue of power. And let me start by introducing my colleague, Dr. Nasser, Nasaruddin Matt Isa. He's the CEO of the Global Movement of Moderates Foundation. He served in the Malaysian Parliament in two terms, and he's also lectured in different Malaysian universities. Um, he published quite widely, and his uh, recent books, the first one is Between Universal and Cultural Relativity of Human Rights, an Islamic and Malaysian Perspective, and the other one is Between Moderation of Extremism, Wasatia is a Peace, um, peace Response. Well, um, to talk about uh, moderation, moderation of power, I think he's the right person uh, uh, to, talk to uh, talk to us. And, and Dr. Issa, it's over to you. Thank you, Professor Haspalan. Um, thank you all for uh, joining me in this next half an hour. Uh, the topic that's been uh, chosen for me to uh, speak, which is on the power of moderation, has been introduced shortly just now. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Global Movement of Moderates. So I'll take this opportunity to present to you and to share with you uh, what is the Global Movement of Moderates and what is this initiative is all about, what we have been doing and what we intend to do. Uh, it is a small contribution from a small country of Malaysia. I come from Malaysia. Uh, the Global Movement of Moderates is initially uh, was uh, presented by the Malaysian Prime Minister, the current Malaysian Prime Minister, in his speech at the United Nations General Assembly in 2010, and the office was established in 2012. And I was made the CEO last year, and this is my first year in office. The whole idea of the Global Movement of Moderates is a, a call for all the moderates, especially leaders of all religions, to marginalize extremists, reclaim the center stage, and shape the agenda towards peace, embedding values of mutual respect, and coexistence along the way. That is the main uh, theme and the main uh, area of interest that we are working on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was established in 2012. The area of operation is three, locally, regionally, and internationally. Locally, um, we have been uh, working since 2012 in establishing our contacts with universities. We have signed several MOUs with universities and also research organizations in Malaysia and also uh, working with uh, civil societies uh, back at home in Malaysia. Uh, the reason why we are concentrating locally is, as you might have read, that uh, up till date, uh, Malaysia has detained 285 uh, people involved with Daesh, those who intended to go to Syria or those who, want, or those who already came back from Syria. And uh, we foresee that uh, it is quite an uh, interesting development, so there is a need for us to have a, a proper structured counter-narrative against this development in Malaysia. So that is the reason why the main activities locally is concentrated in universities and uh, the CSOs. Regionally, uh, especially in ASEAN, uh, last year ASEAN Summit has agreed to upgrade the global movement of moderate has not just a Malaysian initiative, but it was upgraded last year in the summit as an ASEAN initiative. And one of the programs that we have to organize since last year is to organize these ASEAN roundtable talks on moderation. We had the first one in Singapore last year. The, the latest one was just about two weeks ago. We had it uh, organized in Laos, in Vientiane. And the purpose of this round talk, uh, roundtable talk is to uh, garner the support and also to 
collectively collect and uh, all the values that we have in ASEAN. As you know, that ASEAN is a very uh, vast multiracial, multicultural, and multireligious uh, uh, community. We have the largest uh, Muslim population in Indonesia, the largest Catholic country being the Philippines, and a good mixture of all in, in Malaysia. One of the largest Buddhist population in the world is in that part of the world, you know, Myanmar, um, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and, and whatnot. So, with this uh, diverse uh, mixture of uh, background, we foresee that uh, ASEAN has a lot to offer to the world in promoting moderation. And that is why, in the movement, in the global movement of moderates, we are not just concentrated uh, on the Islamic issue. Uh, has I mentioned earlier that it has been upgraded as an ASEAN initiative. What we're trying to do is to, to collect all the different values that we have in ASEAN and to come up with an ASEAN um, vision, an ASEAN uh, values of moderation. The third area of uh, operation, if I could uh, say so, is the international level. Um, when I was invited to come and, and give this uh, small introduction of what we're doing uh, with the Global Movement of Moderates. This is what we are doing now, at least from last year, trying to get ourselves engaged with the like minds, uh, with the like uh, organization, who is promoting uh, moderation, though we have discussed it shortly just now. Up till now, I still can't give you the right definition of what moderation is all about. The intention now is to garner, again, you know, different values and different experiences of uh, our partners uh, at international level. Now, uh, going back home with the current threat, with the current development, uh, especially on the expansion of um, extremism and terrorism, one of the areas of concentration that we're working on is on the CVE and providing a counter-narrative. So we, it, we have already promoted some uh, programs uh, back at home, for example, we have come up with a creative content workshop, and it was very interesting this morning when I sh uh, we, we saw the presentation made uh, by Zveda uh, in the presentation on, on uh, using videos uh, as a counter narrative. That is also what we're doing back at home in Malaysia. And uh, also, we are organizing a lot of public uh, education in trying to promote the whole idea of moderation and trying to uh, also promote the awareness among the public. Again, um, looking at ASEAN, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, we foresee that ASEAN could contribute in as far as uh, uh, promoting the values, the common values that we share among us, especially from the religious and the cultural perspective, which is quite totally different from this part of the world. Uh, quite interestingly, uh, Malaysia is in the position to do so in promoting the peaceful coexistence among, among uh, uh, the, 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 the world. Yeah? Malaysia with a total population of about, just about 30 million, but you know, we, the Muslim uh, consists of about 54% of the population. The others are Hindus, Christian, Buddhists, and so on. And I made the point in one of my presentation in Paris uh, recently saying that Malaysia is the only country in the world that celebrates the religious uh, celebration as a national public holiday. And that is something that is, uh, uh, we could be proud to share uh, to the world in respecting uh, not only the religion, but also in respecting the peaceful coexistence among us. And those are the kind of values that we think that could be of, uh, of uh, valuable uh, to, to, to the world. Now, um, coming to uh, rising uh, forum here, my main intention is uh, not only just to present a bit on what we are doing, but to, uh, to promote and to build bridges. You know, upon uh, hearing the presentation since this morning, I think there are a lot of opportunities that we could um, share and then move forward in promoting peace to the world. So that is a bit of what we are doing. The intention is uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, let uh, the world share the experiences and the values from that part of the world because quite many has been uh, touched on the experiences and what have been done from here, 
from Africa from what we, we've heard this morning, but nothing much has been exposed yet from that part of the world. So this is what we are intending to do and to share with, uh, with all of us uh, during this forum. I would like to conclude here by quoting the uh, Malaysia's father of independence in one of his statements uh, in sharing the, 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 the whole idea of, of moderation when he said, and I quote that, in our multicultural society, our Malaysian democracy, nothing is more fundamental than harmony between the many races which form the Malaysian nation. In fact, if I were asked to name one single outstanding quay to explain the success of Malaysia as a free nation, I would without hesitation say it is due to the racial understanding and cooperation. Not only does this harmony express the trends of thought and feeling in this country, but this is a treasure of priceless value to each and every one of us. So I'm calling for sharing of values, sharing of experiences, and sharing of common goals and the need for us to rise the, or to raise the silent uh, majority voices who are against extremism, who are against uh, terrorism, and who are against uh, you know, the, the, the bad act of terrorists. So ladies and gentlemen, that is a brief introduction of what the global movement of moderates is all about, and what we, we have been doing, what we intend to do, and we do hope that through this uh, meeting uh, of minds, through these meetings of uh, uh, different experiences, we could move forward in, um, in, 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 in promoting peace uh, to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Issa, um, in today's world, polarization seems to be the name of the game. Yeah. Um, extremism, insurgencies, terrorism. And in such a world, being a moderate must be such a difficult job. So that's really my first question to you. Where do you get the inspiration from to be a moderate? If you look at the different philosophies of, for example, religion, there is no religion in this world that calls for extremism. Mm -hmm. All the religions are calling for, for, uh, for, for, for moderation. Mm -hmm. Look, from the, uh, being Muslim, Islam has been calling for al wasatiyah since long. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes to Buddhism, they call it Chumil. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing applies to, 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 to Christianity and whatnot. But the only thing that uh, I uh, see that, you know, this whole idea of moderation is not being structured, is not being institutionalized. So this small effort, an initiative by, uh, from Malaysia by the Malaysian Prime Minister, is trying to institutionalize it, bring up the voices, and uh, you know, bring them together in promoting moderation has a common value among us, because it is a common value shared by all religion, it be cultural, it be a society, it be. But the, as I mentioned earlier, that it is that we have not really institutionalize it in the form of a movement. So hopefully, with this small effort, we could uh, you know, call in all these voices as a kind of a movement uh, to promote peace to the world. Mm -hmm. And um, you also mentioned um, faith, different religions, and the way, it, uh, the way um, uh, faith, faith communities, faith leaders, um, um, deal with this whole issue of extremism and, 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 um, and their perspectives. Um, that, that's really uh, something that is quite controversial, isn't it? Often religion is seen as one of the main causes of the conflict. And often we label conflicts as ethno-religious conflicts, for example. Um, what role do you see for faith leaders, for example, whether they are Christians, Muslims, Jewish, or other religions, in the moderation of power? The need to dialogue, have an interfaith uh, dialogue uh, among religion. Uh, the last program that we had in Laos just about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, before organizing the, 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 the meeting, uh, I went down to Philippines to call in the, the Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Emeritus of Davao. Mm -hmm. He's a very famous uh, Archbishop in, in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I have a discussion with him saying that uh, you need to come to this program mm -hmm. and give an exposure of what we have been doing in the Philippines. Because quite interestingly, in the Philippines, they've developed this, this uh, a community or a, another movement by the name of the Ulama Bishop Conference. So they organized this Ulama Bishop Conference. It was an effort done many years ago 
in trying bring, to bring close together between the Muslim and the Christian community, and they have successfully uh, managed to do that uh, throughout the year. There are quite many other issues uh, uh, that are they're developing in that part of the world. For example, the latest issues in, in Myanmar involving the, the Muslim minority. Uh, that particular issue we have not able to do uh, anything yet as for now. But I think uh, what the religious leader could do as for now is uh, to encourage, to develop, and to promote this interfaith dialogue between especially the top leaders uh, of the different religions. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And when it comes to moderation of power and the role of faith and faith leaders, um, obviously there are so many good examples. In my research, uh, we went to Nigeria, for example, and look at the role of faith leaders there uh, in moderating power and also making peace between uh, conflicting sides. But we tend to talk to, or we tend to hear the voice of moderate um, faith leaders in the context of peace. But what should we do to talk to extremist uh, faith leaders? Because, I mean, how would you, for example, talk to ISIS? Because they also talk about faith and they also talk about power yeah. and, and, and they have a certain perspective. I think one of the issues that we need for, to concentrate also, as far as the religious leaders is concerned, is to provide a counter-narrative of what has been, you know, uh, propagated by the other groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have not been talking to ISIS, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, you know, we try to provide a counter-narrative in trying to, to encourage people to understand mm -hmm. the, you know, from the Islamic perspective, the true teaching and the true understanding of what the whole religion is all about. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm, I've been promoting for the need for us to have a, 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 a contemporary uh, messaging uh, of the teaching of Islam in a uh, language that is being spoken currently. And how I see things you know, in, in many parts of the Muslim world is that in providing that counter-narrative, we are not talking the language of the day. We are not using the current media, the, day, the media of the day. You know, it comes in volumes of uh, books written, for example, on the fatwa of, of jihad, for example, in understanding what is the meaning of jihad is all about. Mm -hmm. you know, it comes in volumes of books that has been written, but it, was not, it has not been presented in a modern, uh, contemporary way. So these are the things that we are trying to promote uh, among the Muslim leaders uh, in, in that part of the world, in, in ASEAN, for example. We have talked to the people in Indonesia. I went up to Thailand to talk with the, uh, some institutions who are dealing with religion in, in, in Thailand in the need for them to provide a counter-narrative using the language of the day, mm -hmm. using the media of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's great. I'll take the questions from the floor, but one more question, Please. and I won't let you go without this question. Yeah. As you served in the parliament, in the Malaysian parliament, you, know, you are also a politician, and then politicians also have a certain role in the way uh, power is in the you know, um, extremist or the moderate spectrum. What would you advise to your fellow politicians in other countries to moderate power, for example, to British MPs or the MPs in the uh, European Parliament? What would they do? Well, I used to be a politician. I'm no longer <laughs> involved in politics now. But uh, as uh, we heard today, uh, Andrew Mitchell in the morning, we heard uh, Lord this uh, also mention his statement. And I'd like to quote what Lord Alderdis mentioned uh, earlier, saying that you know, we shouldn't be keep on asking about what you know, uh, the government, for example, the system could do or mm. must do, but we must provide uh, ourselves. And as far as the politician is concerned, well, again, the, the, the different environment, you know, the debate would be different. For example, in Malaysia, there are quite many uh, issues which have uh, able to unite the different benches in, in, in the parliament. Uh, but when it comes to uh, common issues, for example, when there was an attack in Iraq a few years back, you know, the, they called for a special session in the house, and you know, the, 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 the motion was uh, supported by all members of the, of the, of the parliament. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, the role of the parliament, the role of the politician is that, you know, it's not easy, it's easy to say, but I don't think it's that easy to, to work it out, is to choose the right narrative. Again, um, people are convinced, easily convinced by the narrative being used by politicians. So choose the right narrative in promoting uh, 
uh, or encountering uh, violent extremism. So that is the reason why, you know, when, when I received this invitation, I said that I'll come to it because I want to collect the common values that we can share among us because there are quite many values, quite many definitions to it. So by having these different definitions, different values, and different approaches towards moderation, that is where we can then have one, maybe a common uh, uh, movement among us to, to come up with a... I'm, I'm not saying that it's going to be a solution to the problems that we are facing, but maybe we can try to have a, a concerted effort among us to, to share that common values. So by having the different background, by having the different uh, uh, approaches to, to the issues, issues, I know that we're not going to solve the problem, but at least we can ease the issues that, uh, that is there in front of us. I'm trying to focus on the common values that is there. And, and of course, there are a lot of similarities uh, among us. So that is why, you know, though I come from a, a Muslim majority country, me myself being a Muslim, but when we talk about the global movement of moderates, I've been stressing that we shouldn't be focusing only on the Islamic teaching or the, Islamic or the Muslim issues, though that is one of the major main issues that have been faced uh, by Muslims throughout the world. But in promoting the whole agenda of moderation, it should, it should come from all different angles and experiences. For example, I mentioned just now, you know, it is there in the teaching of Confucianism, it is there in the teaching of Christianity, uh, I believe there is also a teaching in, in, in the Torah. So we are trying to find the common values that we can share among us, then move out or move, move forward by, by having that, that, that common uh, you know, standard uh, values that we can share. When the whole idea started in 2010 uh, by my Prime Minister and when I asked him what is the whole intention of creating this movement, he was trying to give an answer to you know, that particular uh, uh, event you know, when we were faced uh, by the issue of Al-Qaeda, uh, we were facing the issues of uh, 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 Taliban, and that part of the world we were facing the issues of Jama Islamiyah. So, and the trend is beginning to develop in, in our community. So in answering to that, you know, uh, especially by using religion as an excuse uh, to promote themselves and religion too to promote the whole idea of extremism, this is where he come up with the ideas in that, that you know, we should go and promote moderation from the teaching of religion. So that is where it started. But as time goes by and the challenges keep on uh, developing, so there is a need uh, for us to have a, a, a different perspective also, not just to concentrate from the religious perspective of moderation. For example, you know, we are talking about religions from, uh, sorry, moderation uh, from the economic perspective, from the political perspective, so on and so forth. So it has to be diversified in the whole range of areas, uh, not to just be concentrated just on religion. Yeah. Many believe that Turkey today is in the path of a full authoritarian regime. So, if that is the picture, not very encouraging, I'm afraid. Let's say, uh, let's, let's think about what might happen. I will just pose some ideas in terms of what might be coming and what factors and developments may play a role in terms of moderation of President's, uh, President Erdogan's power. Let me start with um, Turkish economy. I think since 2002, since the AK Party has come to power, um, one of the main anchors of President Erdogan's power has been Turkish economy. It seems to be relatively successful. But if, if there is a sharp downturn, I would imagine that that will have an impact on, on his power. So I think consumers do have power and uh, we could expect some uh, impact with that. The second one, um, I think the sooner or later, Erdogan will need to adopt a different policy uh, for the continuing uh, fighting against um, PKK, as the insurgency, uh, Kurdish insurgency group. And, and, and with the continuation of their indiscriminate killing, the PKK um, is a real security threat for the country. And co considering what's happening in Syria with ISIS, uh, particularly, and ISIS is very active in Turkey uh, with carrying, uh, carrying out um, uh, different uh, terrorist attacks. I think Turkey will need to deal with the Kurdish issue 
in a different way. And, and probably the reinitiation of the peace process, which failed in 2015, will be a key factor. And, and I think that factor will play a significant role in the moderation of Erdogan's power. The third one, um, this may not be a, an obvious one, but for me, the Russian-Turkish relations will likely to play a significant role. And whether this is in the case of war against ISIS or the, the future of um, Assad or emergence of a Kurdish autonomy in Syria, I think that relationship between the, uh, the two countries will, will play a significant role and, and also for Erdogan's power. Right now, Putin and Erdogan um, are enjoying a second spring in their relationships. But we don't know whether it's going to be followed by a summer, autumn, or even winter. But whatever might happen is likely to have an impact on Erdogan's power in one way or another. The fourth um, um, issue I'd like to bring up is the EU. Turkey-EU relations, um, and within that, I don't think e the EU has much leverage over Turkey. And um, on the one hand, um, Turkey would like to keep its relations with the EU at a certain level because it's one of its largest trade partners. But uh, on that end, as we speak, uh, the EU is now considering whether or not the negotiations with Turkey should be halted completely. So this can also go both ways. And those who follow Turkey-EU relations wouldn't be surprised that, you know, that's probably the norm anyway. But um, I think uh, although Erdogan has much stronger hand uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in drawing up these relationships because of the Syrian refugee crisis, but I see that um, that will also be a factor. And finally, I think we will yet to see what Donald Trump will do with his Middle East policy and whether or not he will see Erdogan as a king or a pawn in his chess game. Thank you very much. I think in terms of the type of leaders you are uh, referring to, uh, this morning we heard a number of times uh, about the failure of liberal democracy. And, and, and within that, um, Turkey is where I'm, I'm originally from. And um, I think uh, to some extent, uh, for many people uh, in the country, uh, Life is quite precarious in terms of many things happening, the wars in Iraq and Syria, refugee crisis, and, uh, and in such an environment um, that tends to be a ten, uh, sort of reliance on powerful figures. And um, uh, Lord Adadai said that, you know, politicians are acting as, as the illusionists. And, and I think, to some extent, some of the illusions promised by Erdogan have actually come true. You know, uh, when you look at the period since 2002, you know, uh, there are tangible benefits that he's provided to the public in Turkey in terms of infrastructure and, uh, and more kind of self-confidence about that, owning the Ottoman history, so on and so forth. So in an environment like that, such leaders, I think, have a quite a strong currency. I was in um, Vol Volgograd recently, former Stalingrad, and uh, so I had that Russian experience and, and what's happening there. And I think your point is really important here because um, I don't think Turkey is at that stage yet, but the, in terms of um, the way the state officials, for example, interacted with civil society organizations, uh, showed a very strong hand and, and powerful uh, engagement, but one-sided very much. And uh, so, um, I think for, for many people, then it becomes an issue of uh, reliance and, and trust. That, that, I think that's really important. That uh, It seems to me that trust in liberal democracy in a number of countries have broken, broken down quite badly. Uh, the promises made by liberal democracy uh, haven't brought up what promise. So in such environments, then what we are seeing is that leaders like Putin and Erdogan and Trump in the U.S. And, and in fact, you know, uh, 
Uh, I'm expecting that that will be a wave of nationalist parties winning elections in Europe because it's an environment of polarization, uncertainty, and in such an environment, Le Pen in, in France and, and others, I think we like it to you know, sort of increase their popularity because what they are promising is stability and a and, and certain version of trust so that people can actually rely on the state. And I think this is why uh, we are going through a very interesting uh, period uh, in, uh, in the world. And some people this morning said that perhaps we are getting ready for the Third World War. And I don't know whether that's the case. But you know, uh, it seems to me that, yes, these leaders have a strong currency in such an environment. P playing with illusions and playing to the gallery seems to be the norms now. Uh, even in that part of the world, Southeast Asia, we are talking about the popularity of uh, President Duterte coming to power and doing whatever he's doing now. But when I was there recently, you know, talking to the general public, he's very popular because he's offering something which is there being wanted by the public. You know, the public says that you know he's promising jobs for us, promising you know to take uh, you know. Um, over the, the drugs uh, mm -hmm. businesses and whatever. So, uh, do you think there's going to be a trend also for the next coming? <laughs> uh, you mean in Turkey? Which I mean, I mean generally. You're know, talking about this using the illusion of you know uh, playing to the gallery and creating popularity among the public, but you know promising things which are quite uh, uh, alarming, if I could so say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what they promise, I mean, I think uh, leaders, coming back to your question, leaders like uh, Putin and, and Erdogan, uh, they seem to be uh, much more successful in connecting with ordinary people. And I think in some, uh, one of the failures of liberal democracy is that uh, I think there is that dislike towards uh, the elites, the, po the political elites. And, uh, and I think this is what, uh, this is what we saw in the U.S. elections, and 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 I think in that context, then um, um, I would say, you know, probably more moderate political leaders should learn from the tactics, political tactics of leaders like Erdogan and, and Putin, and what they do so well in engaging their constituencies. Uh, in fact, there are more than 120 journalists have been in prison uh, since the coup took place. And uh, a number of opposition media outlets have been closed down. And, and even some of the quite mainstream media outlets are now being uh, targeted. And, uh, and the, then, uh, with your question, Erdogan's popularity has in fact increased quite drastically in this uh, queer environment, post queer environment, because, um, you know. That, that surreal experience of the way the coup was kind of staged and then he kind of appeared as the savior of democracy and the way he called ordinary people to the streets to defend democracy. And uh, because before the coup, his popularity was going down quite drastically, he was, more, he was seen more like a divisive leader. But in the post-coup environment, he, uh, he started to be seen as a more unifying leader. Right? And, um, and that was a quite an interesting survey quite recently about the Kurdish crisis in Turkey. Uh, quite a large percentage of the population in Turkey believe that there is only one person who can solve the Kurdish crisis in Turkey, and that is Erdogan. So uh, that's a kind of a good indicator of the way the public sees him and, and, and his power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Issa, do you want to reflect on that? No, you know, it is a good point yes. for me. It is, as I mentioned earlier, that I, need, I need the input and the sharing of the, the, the approaches. And as you rightly say, that if we are not aggressive enough to promote it, then we are, we are just you know, talking to the converts and we're not moving anywhere. So the aggressiveness in our approaches, that is something that, uh, that we have to work on. Yeah. Okay, with that great note then, let me conclude this session. Thanks very much for your participation. Thank you.